All right, take your Bible tonight, turn to Proverbs chapter number 2 tonight. We're dealing with part 2 tonight on a message entitled, The Nothings of Corruption. And this morning we dealt with this issue, got into this issue about corruption, how it leaves you with nothing in your life. It, it, it empties out your life. So we're going to pick up where we left off in Proverbs chapter number 2. Notice what uh, Solomon says here. Who rejoice, oh, Proverbs 2, verse 14. That would help to get the verse, amen? Uh, Proverbs 2, 14. Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked. You know, King Solomon had a great deal to say about those whose minds were defiled and filled with perversity. And he talks about those who delight in the forwardness of the wicked. Now, let's flip over to one other verse, Proverbs 11, chapter 11, and look at verse number 20. He talks about the forward person again. <clears throat> verse number 20, They that are of a forward heart are abomination, wow, to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way, are his delight. So let's pray and we'll get into this. Lord, thank you again for the evening. Bless the preaching of your word. Help me to speak clearly. Help me to speak in a way where our folks will be able to understand what I'm saying. Help us to put into practice the truths. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. And they that are of a forward heart are an abomination. Now, what's that all about? Well, that word forward there is from a Hebrew word which means this. A forward person is twisted, crooked. He's distorted or perverted. This word describes the wicked as having a, wisted, a, a twisted or distorted minds. Their thinking is corrupt and is consistently warped and focused on evil. In fact, people like this, they will take something that is wholesome, something that is innocent, and they'll turn it into something that's perverted. Filthy words or stories as well as blasphemy will come from their lips. The Bible says they lack a pure heart. You know, the sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were men that were perverted in their actions and in their thinking. They turned the service of the Lord into a brothel, sexually seducing the women that served at the entrance of the tabernacle of the Lord. You know, Proverbs chapter 6. Look, I'll, let me, I'll turn over there, okay? Proverbs 6. Look at verse 12. And notice what Solomon says right here. Proverbs 6, 12. He says, A naughty person... A wicked man walketh with a froward mouth. Look at verse 14. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Naughty, wicked people, they walk or live day by day speaking things that are corrupt, crooked, or perverse. They have what the Bible says, a forward, filthy mouth. Now what comes from their mouths flows from the fountain of their hearts. Solomon states they devise mischief continually. Nothing is pure to them. Uh, look at Proverbs 6.14 again. Notice that word deviseth there. That word deviseth, that's an interesting word. It comes from the Hebrew word karash. This word was, was a word that was used to describe a farmer that plowed his land to prepare it for the seed or just to describe an engraver that would cut into the stone. The wicked man consistently, constantly, continually plans, plots, and sows mischief scarring or leaving his mark on people's lives like an engraver that cuts into stones. The seeds that he has planted 
yield a crop of corruption. Uh, Notice the word mischief there. That is a stronger word in the Hebrew language. It's from the word ra, which means evil, distress, uh, misery, injury, calamity, adversity. The wicked, good-for-nothing person consistently thrives on creating pain and pandemonium for people. Two people that come to mind when I think about these verses are Ahab and Jezebel. Their legacy is one of corruption. Proverbs 4.16 says, For they sleep not except they have done mischief. And their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. Proverbs 16, 27 says, An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is a burning fire. Wicked people get their kicks in doing evil things. I remember high school. And I remember those, there were kids in school, they were, they were bullies. And they seems like they just never could be happy unless they were hurting somebody or getting in trouble or beating up on somebody just doing one thing after another. What makes wicked people happy is doing something that is wrong, and that's the way these gangs were. They think it's fun to indulge in perversity or perversion. And it doesn't make any difference if somebody gets hurt. If they get a girl pregnant, well, too bad for her. They don't care. If someone becomes a drug addict or a drunk, It doesn't bother them at all. People like this, they have a warped mind. You know, in the 16th century, did you know that children fairy tale stories were very violent, bloody, and gruesome? Because children in the Elizabethan times were considered miniature adults. They were not innocent at all, but hardened. The children were hardened by sin and the circumstances from life that they faced every day. They were exposed to filthy, vulgar language constantly. The lack of privacy in their crowded homes exposed them to nudity and sex. They witnessed drunkenness and they drank liquor themselves at an early age. Many of them were hardened by their sin which snatched away their innocence. Their minds became defiled and unbelieving as well as their conscience. That's what was going on. Violence, cruelty, and death were no strangers at all to them as they witnessed in the public squares hangings and beheadings uh, of criminals and whoever was being put to death. They saw that. Man, people came out. They thought it was entertainment, many of them. It was not a good time to raise a child in that day. In fact, the harshness and the wickedness of those times were reflected in the stories of the children. They were violent and bloody just like they are today. Many people do not realize that the original versions of popular fairy tales were violent and gruesome and have been changed or toned down through the years. For example, the original Sleeping Beauty does not end happily once the princess is awakened by a kiss. Didn't end that way. Her troubles just began when she woke up. She was raped and abandoned and her illegitimate twin children 
were threatened with cannibalism. That was the original Sleeping Beauty story. In the authentic version of Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf had to digest the grandmother when he pounced on Red Riding Hood and ripped her to pieces from limb to limb in that story. That's the way it ended. Unfortunately, we see the traits of vileness in children today. Many of many children today, many of them curse and use vile, filthy language. Some drink like sailors, not only in high school and junior high, they're drinking in grade school now. They drink like sailors. Many of them are addicted to drugs. A number of them are involved in sexual immorality or they have been raped by their family members. Sexual promiscuity should be no surprise because these kids today are being taught in our public schools how to have sex. And many of them have access to pornographic movies on their televisions and computers. They're, they're teaching our kids immorality in our school system. And they're starting in the kindergarten. It's been made law in the state of Illinois. The perversity of our nation has reached into the hearts, even the youngest of our children, hardening them to the gospel and robbing our kids of their innocence and their childhood nature. They're forcing our kids to grow up while they're children. God help us. Under the pure, all things are pure. Beloved, when the conscience is accurately and fully infused and saturated with the truth of God's Word, it functions as a warning system that God designed in us. It develops purity of character and strong morals, filling our minds with Scripture is essential if we are to guard our hearts and our conscience. You need the Scriptures in your life. You know, the story is told of a pastor that had dinner uh, with a young couple in the church. And after he left their home, the wife said to the husband, she said, I think the pastor stole our silver spoon. This bothered them for an entire year. A year later, the, the couple had the pastor over their house again for dinner. Unable to resist, the wife bluntly asked her pastor, Did you steal our spoon last year? Awkward. <laughs> the pastor replied, No, but I put it inside your Bible. She would have found it if she had taken time to read the Bible. Beloved, get into God's Word. Psalm 119, verse 11. Verse 11 Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Oh, may that be our prayer. Lord, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to sin against you. Psalm 1, verse 2, talking about the blessed man, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Man, get you a verse, memorize it, and just start chewing on it in your mind all day long and just say Lord show me truths from this verse 
things I've never seen before. How many of you understand that? You read the scriptures. I mean, you've been reading the scriptures for 40 or 50 years. And boy, you come across a verse that you've read for years and all of a sudden it jumps out and you'll learn something new. How many understand what I'm saying? Raise your hand. Isn't it neat how, how that happens? Well, that can happen all the time when you memorize a scripture and begin to meditate on it. Think about it. Carry, a, carry a little, some paper with you and a pen so you can write down right away what God has showed you and, and, sh and what God's teaching you. You know, Psalm 37 verse, verse 31 says, The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Psalm 40 verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. If you want to be happy about doing God's will in your life, then hide His Word in your heart. You know, when we look at the church uh, at Laodicea, there in the book of Revelation, we find that their corruption left them with nothing. There was corruption in that church. Let's go to Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and I want to direct your attention to chapter 3, verse number 17. Revelation 3, 17, speaking about the church at Laodicea. He says in verse 17, of course, verse 16 talked about the fact that they were lukewarm and had made God sick. They just made the Lord sick. So look at verse 17. Because thou sayest, now this is the Lord talking here, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. And have, here it is, need of nothing. And knowest not, here's the rebuke, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Wow, what a difference of opinions there. Laodicea was founded by Antiochus II and named after his wife in about 250 B.C. The word means judging or the rights of the people. That's what Laodicea means. It was a city of wealthy bankers and financiers. You could say it was the place of Wall Street, okay? It was a city of money and one of the wealthiest cities in the entire world with three important trade routes passing right through the city. Those three interstates converged on Laodicea. The many millionaires in this city combined their financial strength to build theaters, huge stadiums, lavish public baths, fabulous shopping centers, and a medical school. That's all that existed in Laodicea. The city was so strong financially that when it suffered from a serious earthquake, it refused aid from others and rebuilt the city with its own finances. Much of their wealth came from the manufacturing of a raven, black, soft, glossy wool. This place bred excellent sheep known for the remarkable softness of their wool. Laodicea was also an important city, not only for the money that was there, but because of the medicine. A certain ointment made of nard was used to cure eyesores that people had. Celerium was a famous eye salve that was made in this city. An eye powder, known as Phrygian powder, was a remedy for weak and ailing eyes and ears. The people would take clay from the hills, mix the clay with spikenard, and make it into a salve for ailing eyes and ears. 
This salve was shipped all over the Roman Empire. Now, the city worshipped the pagan god, Men, which was the god of healing. This was the environment where the church of Laodicea, Laodicea existed. The church suffered from corrupt conclusions and attitudes that caused them to believe they had no needs of anything at all. They had no need for anything, when in essence, they really had nothing at all. They thought they abounded, but they didn't have anything. They suffered from self-deception. It was a church that was most likely filled with either backslidden, carnal, apathetic Christians, or people who were not Christians at all because the people were arrogant and dependent on their self-righteousness to save them. They claimed to be rich, when in reality they were poor, even though they had gold and possessed great riches. The Lord told them, you're poor. You think you're rich, but you're poor. Their wealth clouded their thinking and gave them a false sense of security. Wealth will do that if you don't watch out. That can be a problem for those who are controlled by wealth and suffer from a self-righteous, proud attitude. In fact, Proverbs 13, 7 says, there is, there is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. That's what Solomon says. Luke 18, 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Yet this Pharisee had nothing because he had a pompous, self-righteous attitude. Isaiah said it's a bunch of filthy rags. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Well, the Laodicean church, they failed to do that. John 9, 41, Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. That's Laodicea. The Laodiceans, they claimed to see, but they were spiritually blind. Even though they made eye salves and eye powders, they were spiritually blind. They were blind to the truth of their spiritual condition. Some were blind to the gospel. Let me stop and ask right there. Are you blind to your spiritual condition? Do you know what's going on in your spiritual life? Do you have a spiritual thermometer? Do you keep tabs on what's going on in your heart? How many understand what I'm asking right now? You keep check on yourself. Do you know if you're close to the Lord or do you know if you're cooled off? You and I have a responsibility to examine ourselves and stay close to the Lord and keep tabs on ourselves. Don't you be worried about everybody else. You worry about yourself because that's a full-time job in itself. Keep close to the Lord. Man, if you do something stupid one day, ask God to forgive you. If you hurt somebody's feeling or wrong somebody, get it right, ask for forgiveness, and, and ask God to help you never do it again. But you keep tabs on your spiritual condition. Well, the Laodicean church did not do that. You know, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 talks about those who are blind to the gospel. Paul said in, in verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Beloved, we're light bearers. 
We're to be sharing the gospel with those who need Jesus Christ. Jesus said also of the Laodicean church, he, he, these, these people, they had good clothing. But God said, now, <laughs> you're naked. They were even, they were naked even though they produced that soft, silky, shiny black wool. Their expensive clothes would not cover their sinful condition. Their nakedness indicated their spiritual poverty and inability to cover their corruption. The Laodiceans, they were not satisfied with the promises of God. They endeavored to satisfy themselves with things, with possessions. They were like the dog with a bone that saw his image in a clear pool of water beneath his feet. The dog let go of his bone to take the bone out of the mouth of the dog in the water's reflection. And he ended up losing the bone that he had. So many people are dissatisfied with what God has given them and done for them because they are always wanting something else that will supposedly satisfy them. It won't. Just mark it down. The result is they do not enjoy the blessings that God has given to them, the blessings they already have. That was the Laodicean condition. Jesus said of these folks, you guys are wretched, which means distressed or afflicted. The Lord looked upon these people with pity. They possessed much of this life, but they had nothing for the life to come. Those who were backslidden and carnal, would basically have no rewards coming at the judgment seat of Christ because they basically were just doing their own thing and not serving the Lord. And those who were lost in sin, they would not go to heaven because they did not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. When a person is a Christian, and that Christian is away from God, has cooled off spiritually, or if that person is not saved at all, that person is miserable. Oh, they may say they got their life together, but when you leave the Lord out of your life, you're going to be miserable. The unsaved sinner that dies without the Lord Jesus Christ will be miserable for eternity. They will always be miserable. They will be basically in agony as they will burn in the flames of hell forever and never get out. These folks spiritually were in bad shape. You know, when the Lord looks at our church, I wonder what our report card would be. I hope we're not in spiritual bad shape. I hope that everything we do here honors Him and makes Him happy. And I know there's always room for improvement as a church family. You know, Jesus said, because they were lukewarm he would spit or vomit them out of his mouth. Their apathetic, arrogant, self-righteous condition made Jesus sick to his stomach. Oh, God help us. I hope, I hope that our church doesn't do that. I, hope that. I hope that what we do here pleases him. And I hope that he's always honored here in whatever we do, in the preaching, in the singing, even in the fellowship we have with one another, the spirit of our people, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of love for one another, and the spirit of that love for Jesus Christ. Man, I hope we never lose that. Corrupt conclusions and attitudes leave a person with nothing in the end. It leads to a loss of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ or a lost opportunity to be saved. May we, may we take heed to the lessons of the nothings of corruption. God help us to not make the Lord nauseated. 
May we not stand before the judgment seat of Christ empty-handed of his reward. May God use our church family to win the lost, to help Christians grow in the Lord, and to encourage Christians and encourage other pastors in this country and overseas just to keep on going, to keep on serving Jesus, because there's a lot of them out there that are discouraged right now. May God use us to do that.